Hello! Welcome to my first live show. It's a Pride Brunch. Uh, we've got really exciting things happening today. Uh, I've got some really great guests, uh, and I want to invite uh, Dennis Tabinski and Darian Schulman, two very good friends, to join me on stream and introduce themselves. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Hi, it's so nice to have you on the show. Yeah, it's, it's, it's good to be see fun. you. It's been, you know, it's been kind of a long time coming. Uh, the I was uh, a guest on uh, Dennis Dennis's podcast, uh, oh, kind of a while back, and that's when we first met. Yeah, so that was full circle now. Yeah, right. <laughs> Absolutely. So I want you to introduce yourselves. Tell me a little bit about yourselves. Tell me what you do, who you are, where, where are you streaming from? Uh, we are streaming from Astoria in uh, Queens, in New York City. In our kitchen. Yeah, in our, in our kitchen. In your kitchen. <laughs> uh, and what do you do? Who, who are you? Why, why did I invite you on Cooking with Creatives? <laughs> I'll let you go first, Darren. <laughs> okay. Um, Darian Schulman. I'm a, a composer. Um, focus on uh, media, uh, film and TV scoring. I um, also do uh, some music for podcasts, that kind of thing. Um, so uh, that's what I do. <laughs> and... <laughs> And uh, I'm I'm also a composer, uh, primarily, uh, really kind of explicitly, uh, you know, classical music. Um, write a lot of art song. Um, I'm a vocalist. I was and will be again a podcaster. <laughs> um, and I also run a company called New Music Shelf. It's a boutique uh, a music publishing house that specializes in uh, new music. Wonderful. Yeah, it's it's a really great. Um, it's a really great project that uh, Dennis has been working on, and I'm sure we'll get to that and we'll talk about it. Um, I want to hear all about it. Um, but uh, I want to just like get started with cooking because I don't know about you, but I'm actually very hungry. <laughs> oh, sounds good I, to me. I actually pour myself a bowl of cereal, uh, and I hope oh, that's, that's <laughs> a real brunch because brunch brunch is basically, in my in my opinion, brunch starts when you decide it starts. Exactly. exactly. Um, which is why I'm going to pour myself a drink. I'm all for that. Uh, I, I went out and I bought stuff to make mimosas because I haven't had brunch uh, with two or more gay folk, if I'm going to say that, since I moved uh, from Seattle, uh, uh -huh. which makes me really sad. So this has been... That's one of the reasons why I wanted to do this. Uh, and I said, I feel like what's more brunch than mimosas? That's exactly what I'm making for myself here. With Astoria Prosecco. Oh, I, I picked up a Cordon Negro Brut. Nice. Uh, mostly because that was what was on sale. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Um, but, uh, anyways, so, uh, what are we cooking today? Uh, today, um, it's a breakfast casserole. Yeah, yeah, um, Spencer asked if, you know, if there were any, anything we, we wanted to make for brunch, and a couple of months ago, I, just to have something to bring to the office for the day job, um, I made this little casserole, found a recipe online that, that I liked, so it's a nice hash brown and sausage casserole. That's spectacular. I um, I will say I, I, I tested this out and I really loved it. And when I really love a recipe or like the concept of a recipe is when I really start to tweak it and, and start oh, yeah. to be like, oh, I found something that I really like and I want to invest in making it mine just because I feel like that's just me, how I cook. And that, that's kind of like my cooking style. Um, the Although I did not change... Uh, the scallion pancake that I made with Jennifer Jolly, because um, <laughs> uh, I had never had it before, and it was delicious. That episode comes out on Tuesday, so that we're we're really excited for that one. Right. It's back in the fridge, um, and so yeah, I really messed with uh, the recipe. Totally messed with the recipe, uh, and I'm making a Mexican-inspired uh, breakfast casserole with three different types of peppers, 
di different types of cheeses. Um, and, uh, but the hash browns are still there. The eggs are still there. Um, and I, and I mostly did that because, uh, I, I felt like the thing about a good casserole is that you can make like casseroles exist in many different cultures. Oh yeah. Um, and I feel like there's something really homey about a casserole that makes you feel really good. Oh, yeah. And I was kind of missing home a little bit. So this, <laughs> this was me kind of missing home a little bit. Yeah. Cheers. Happy pride. Happy pride. Um, I wish that we could be oh. celebrating pride together uh, and with the parade and, and all of that. But, know. Uh, but you know, um, I think that during this time where, you know, when this isn't happening, you know, I, I'm just thinking back to the history of the whole community um, and the fact that this seems like small compared to that, even though it's not like that's, I don't know that sounds like weird to say, but like the fact that we can sit here and have a live show and talk about these things. Yeah. Is just like, like completely open and honest. is just like really exciting for me. And, um, and the fact that I'd be even comfortable doing that, uh, <laughs> I can't have seen that even five years ago. So oh, um, I know. Yeah. For myself, so. Nice. Yeah, definitely so, feels different this year than it did. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. it feels a little bit more, um, the more relevant, yeah, it does. For the list. <laughs> it, it totally does. Um, so, the normally when I'm on the show, I and and when I'm not live, um, things kind of just happen when they happen um, as far as cooking. Um, but because we're live, you get to see like behind the scenes, like me messing around in the kitchen, um, and so uh, for. For at least for me, I'm gonna start by whisking some eggs. Um, Perfect. I'll join you. What should I do? Uh, the the I'll whisk the eggs. Or I, I ask anybody who is watching, um, as you start watching, feel free to make any comments in the chat, um, and we will try to answer any questions that you have about what we're doing, about who we are. Um, we'll get to talk more about uh, Dennis and Darian's music later <laughs> on. We'll have uh, my good friends Kakia and Kendra join us, who are here in Mich who live here in Michigan, um, and uh, really wanted. I felt like brunch with only two people, uh, three people, wasn't like a full brunch, um, at least in my experience. So uh, I had to invite some people who I also really care about, but. Uh, um, they'll be on in a little bit. Uh, so, uh, anyways, so, um, let's talk about, um, I want to hear a little bit more about, uh, your, your publishing, um, organization, uh, Dennis. Yeah. So, um, New Music Shell started, um, literally a decade ago, not as a publisher, but as a, um, uh, digital dis distribution company. I need all that wash my hands. Uh, put this um, so composers could uh, submit scores to be uh, sold in digital format uh, on the website, and that limped along for a while, and I got kind of tired of it. Um, it, <laughs> uh, it sort of suffered from some uh, benevolent neglect for a while. Um, and I, in 2017, I almost shut it down. Um, I, it was too much work in its, in its, uh, form at the time. So, um, I was talking to people and they were like, no, don't do it. Um, and I, I was able to kind of reimagine the company <clears throat> so that it had a, an actual publishing arm as well, which has sort of become the prime primary focus now. Um, so what I do is I uh, publish uh, volumes of new music, uh, collections uh, between 16 and 20 pieces, typically uh, in a single volume for you know a specific instrument. So the first four volumes were all art song, one uh, you know, soprano, one mezzo, one tenor, one baritone. Um, mm -hmm. Did huge calls for scores, got in almost a thousand uh, submissions that first time. 
and uh, you know sent the the soprano songs to uh, a soprano that I know who's very uh, like into new music, a big champion for it. Uh, same with mezzo, uh, baritone. I took the tenor stuff, um, and you know we just we we went through all the selections. Uh, Laura, the soprano, had to go through 400 art songs, um, which is kind of a lot. And uh, we pared that down to 20 a piece. Um, and so I collected, you know, licensed with the composers, so they all get a royalty um, and they maintain their copyright, which is important to me. Um, we don't need this anymore. I don't need to do that. Um, yeah, these are what's. <laughs> good job. Um, collected uh, the works into volumes and published them. And uh, then we all did concerts to promote the, the books. We performed uh, almost all the selections. So almost 80 art songs we did over the course of four concerts. Um, and now I've expanded into instrumental music and it just keeps growing. That's, yeah, I mean, I've been very impressed by everything I've seen with that. It's, uh, um, you know, I, I wanted to give uh, Dennis a chance just to chat about that because I think that um, what he's doing has been really, really great for contemporary music because I, at least for me, um, whenever I talk to in, like per, like performers, they know of the the different composers that their teachers know. Yes. Um, and then you get these like bubbles of just composers who like performers that only play certain composers because that's the only person that their teacher knows. Um, yeah, the, the the whole thing really came out of a, a Facebook post. Um, I you know belong to a number of musician groups, and. Um, I remember seeing in, in one of the singer groups, a teacher or a singer, you know, right? I'm, you know, I, I teach at a, a school and I want my students to do more new music, but, you know, everybody self publishes now. So I don't know where to look. And, you know, as composers, we know that, you know, people can't find you unless they know who you are for the most part. So I wanted to, to create a discoverability tool. You know, I've been trying to, figured that out for years. And uh, that Facebook post, I said, oh, wait, I can I can do that. I can collect works and, and put together a, a way for, for composers to, to be discovered, um, you know, beyond. I mean, if you're if you're a singer, you're, you're used to hearing like the new music is always um, just to, to name a few names that there's nothing disparaging, but like, we all know, like, the Jake Heggie and we know the the Jason Robert Brown, but we don't necessarily you know necessarily know the you know eighty com or sixty three composers who were <laughs> in uh, these these volumes like because they're mostly self published. Um, so it, it's nice to be able to advocate for people who are excellent at what they do, but just haven't been ha haven't gotten the broad uh, exposure that they deserve. Absolutely. And, you know, it's uh, it can be so hard to to get that exposure because of all the gatekeeping that exists yeah. in, in all these different areas. One, it's so funny because, like, the names that you specifically mentioned um, are very specific to your own, you know, musical, yes. uh, you know, experience. Because while I know who those composers are, they're not the people that I would immediately say, oh, well, we all know these people, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, because we all have those composers that we you know if that's our instrument like we all know that composer yeah um but uh th that that's what i think i really love about this though is that um you have these anthology series that um in many ways bring together the wider music community yeah to explore other composers and be like oh i've never heard of this composer before mm -hmm. maybe they have something for my instrument maybe yeah. they have something for like wait He's got a, he got, or she got selected, um, or they got selected for this, um, you know, for this voice call. Maybe they've got a violin piece or a viola piece, which you have a viola book and you yeah. have a piano book. And, and I just think that, you know, I really loved seeing the direction that you've taken with, um, with that program because it's just so important for composers to, you know, particularly self-published composers 
um, to just get their name out there. And yeah. particularly right now with things like Midwest getting canceled, like oh, I know. so many composers get their exposure from going to these different conferences and yeah, and people. And Right now, uh, the National Association of Teachers of Singing, NATS, uh, they're having, like, they were supposed to have their conference right now, and they're having it virtually. Um, I was going to be a vendor there. Uh, obviously, I'm not in uh, Knoxville right now, because <laughs> uh, that would be dangerous. Um, so, like, I, I did Na uh, the National NATS conference uh, two years ago, and that was, it was great to be able to talk to all these teachers about, you know, these, these composers. And, and with the like extra discoverability, kind of what you were saying, um, like in especially the, the vocal books, a lot of the, the art songs are from larger cycles and larger collections of, of songs. So when that's the case, or if, you know, for the viola book or the saxophone book, if there's a single movement from a larger multi-movement piece, I always make a point underneath the title of the, you know, the movement or the song, say from the, you know, the title of the larger work, because I want performers to, to see this and say, oh, there's more. Let me, let me explore this. And at the back of every book, every composer has their own bio page with, a, you know, the URL of their website, their email address, if they, they're willing to share it, social media handles, if they want to share those, you know, it, it's, I'm really trying to tear down barriers between performers and composers. You know, in traditional publishers, there's a there's a brick wall there. Um, you know, you're not going to find a composer's personal website listed on their score if they're published by one of the big houses because the houses want they want the traffic, and so they end up being these gatekeepers and if you want to reach out to a composer, you have to do the research to find them uh, rather than having that information given to you by the publisher. So I, I really want, you know, performers to reach out to composers and say, you know, maybe, hey, I'd like to commission you or, hey, I'm performing this piece on such and such date. Um, can you be there? Or just, I just want to let you know, maybe you can put it on your calendar or blast it on social media. You know, and just have it have an actual dialogue rather than you know like the composer being you know afar. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, it's so funny because I um, and I obviously won't say who it is, but the um, like I just had a recent experience where uh, you know I was talking with a publisher um, that I'm not affiliated with, um, and. Uh, <clears throat> You know, it's it's so interesting because they almost even seemed like they were like promoting, like talking about that in the same way because they're also a composer, right? Yeah. Um, and so many so many publishers like got their start as composers or or do compose, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so like, because uh, where do you think they learn the skill, the engraving skills? Where do you think they? <laughs> not, I mean, that's not always the case, but the yeah. it definitely was in this case, and um, and so to to just have somebody who's out there advocating for composers but like not for like not just for your own interests it's, yeah it's just something that you don't see in the publishing industry um and that and, and so much in music sometimes it can feel like you have to do it all for yourself mm -hmm. and that's just not really like like that's not the way that i live that's not the the experience that i've had with uh with music just because i kind of try to surround myself with people who are in it as a community. Um, yeah. And that's part of the reason why I started this show, just because um, it, it was really about the community and the wider community, not just, hey, I play saxophone or I write a lot of saxophone music, so I'm gonna have just saxophonists on. If you're a yeah. saxophonist and that's all you do, that makes sense. And there yeah. is a really great, uh, there are a couple of great web series that have come out recently um, interviewing saxophonists. But like the thing that I feel like I'm really great at is like connecting with people, um, yeah. but like in and without like a whole lot of like preconceived like. Well, I don't write band music, so I'm gonna you know not <laughs> talk to band composers because what does that get for me? Um, yeah. But like I've learned a lot. I mean, like I, I mean, I've started writing some band music, but it was just purely by getting involved with that community that I learned new things and learned things that I didn't even know that I liked. 
Oh, I know. So, um, anyways, cool. Let's uh, uh, move to Darian. Um, yes. So oh, well, you are, um, you know, you work in <coughs> uh, media arts um, mostly. Um, tell me, I guess the thing that I'd be interested in hearing about is uh, one, like, how did you how did you get into that? Because um, I think a lot of young composers, when they first start composing, they that's what they want to do. Um, I myself included, right? Um, yeah. Uh... How did I get into it? Well, it's sort of, it's sort of what I started out wanting to do, I suppose, when I was young. And, uh, uh, you know, as you come up, as you grow up, uh, the idea of uh, composing for film and for TV is uh, definitely, um, I don't know if I would call it stigmatized in the sort of serious community. Uh, but, uh, there, there's definitely a sort of, um, uh, you know, looking down on your nose about it. Um, and so, uh, I was very much encouraged in college to, you know, focus primarily on, you know, concert music and that sort of thing. And then by the time I was in grad school, I found myself just, you know, uh, just just dissatisfied and I spoke to I, and I said to my teacher at the time I was you know he said what do you really want to do and I said well I started out wanting to do film composing and he said well why don't you he said well why don't you just do that then and I was like and I couldn't come up with a good reason that didn't sound make me sound <laughs> like an idiot so I was like yeah you're right so that's you know, I started doing student films from there, and I find it incredibly gratifying and enjoyable, and um, and it's you know it's what I really love to do. So, I mean, you know, looking back, I would have probably chosen some different schools, um, <laughs> but uh, it is uh, you know. It's just, that was just my path. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's so interesting you say that about the school thing, because um, I, uh, I've been thinking a lot recently, because I have a couple, I teach quite a bit of composition, um, and I've got a couple students who are at that stage now where they're looking at college, they're not sure where they want to go, um, and I know, like, what they want to do now might change, so, like, you know, they should definitely keep that in mind, but, but I feel like there's like there was an older way of thinking when it comes to like going to study music in school um mm -hmm. where you go study at a school where there's a composer whose music you like right yeah which i think is that's what happened that, that was yeah that, yeah I mean, that's exactly i mean that was my situation and i've talked to a number of people and that's what they've said is that you know they got the advice that they got was go study with a composer whose music you like um and the problem that I have with that is, is that, you know, the, com the music that you like isn't always necessarily the person that's going to be the mentor that you need, isn't always going to be the, um, or, or might not necessarily have had the same experience because they might be older, um, which was definitely this situation that I had. Um, and you know, I everything worked out. Obviously, like I'm very happy where I'm at. But there was a lot of things that I had to do in between that I could have skipped with just the right mentor, right? Sure. Um, yeah. <clears throat> but uh, but yeah. So uh, so you you that's how you got into it. So uh, what kind of projects do you work on now then, mostly? So uh, I'm in mostly I'm doing uh, uh, docu series. Like that's sort of where I'm. Uh, where I'm most active, so like docu series and mock you series, even. <laughs> um, so uh, uh, the probably the most notable thing is, that uh, you might have heard my music on is this show called American Vandal, which is <clears throat> which ran two seasons on Netflix, um, and then uh, also on um, the. First episode of Trial by Media, which is also on Netflix. That's a, a docu series. That first episode focuses on the 
um, uh, Jenny Jones murder. I'm not sure if you are aware of that. It was a, it was a pretty big court case in the late nineties. Um, and yeah, I do. Um, you know, it's, I, uh, I feel like one of the few court cases that I've actually ever really paid attention to was the Jody Arias story. Yes. And I'm saying Arias because my last name is Arias. And I, her, her last name is spelled the same way as mine, so I'm specifically not pronouncing it the, the right way. Um, the, it's funnier because my little brother's name is Jordan Arias. Uh -huh. um, so, and she's also from Arizona, so, uh -huh. which is where I'm from. So it, I kind of like always kind of avoided them, although I have watched an episode of your show just so I could hear your music. Oh, um, yeah. The, but I... Uh, uh, yeah, it, it, it's something I've definitely avoided. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's not something I really uh, watched uh, in particular. In fact, I, you know, I was not really that into, um, do like, I was not into the concept of, like, scoring documentaries or docu-series. Docu-series. What's, like, the plural of docu-series? Docu-series, yeah. Um, I was, um, it was not something that I sort of envisioned myself doing. I, uh, you know, I thought, I, um, and I still would like to get into more kind of scripted, um, you know, kind of traditional, uh, content. Um, but, um, what basically happened was, um, some of the, uh, filmmakers who I had been working with for, you know, several, several years, um that's their kind of bread and butter they love that kind of thing and so they uh really really are into you know sort of capturing all of the you know the sort of tropes that you find in series like that like um you know the interviews recreations um timelines uh <laughs> you know graphics all that kind of thing um, so they love it and they kind of pulled me into it and, um, I'm way more into it now than I was before. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, I feel like that's kind of how it works though. If you, like, if you're doing something that you love, even if it's like maybe only semi related to what you really want to do, yeah. I feel like it's, a, it's a lot easier to like learn to really like something because you learn that maybe the things that you didn't see just from the outside? Yeah, you know, you view it as a challenge. Um, I mean, I always work really well when, you know, some sort of constraint is, you know, imposed upon me. And it's usually better when, it, when it's external. I think that's partially why I like doing film and TV scoring so much is because I'm, you know, it's not just me sitting in front of a, you know, uh, blank page, being able to do anything I want. I'm working with, you know, um, somebody else and working with, you know, a sort of a picture that I, you know, is serving to inspire me and, and um, you know, bounce things off of. Um, and so with, you know, with doing something like a docu-series, which is not something I'm like, had been used to doing, you know, applying that to, you know, okay, how do I make the, you know, how do I make this work as compelling content when it's like just an interview, for example, you know, how do I score this where it's just a talking head? Are we, switching? can we switch? Oh, I'm just showing, showing them what, what's happening in my pan. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, gotcha. Yes. Oh, neat. I don't so, know. If we, are we are we capable of doing that on our end? I uh, could probably do that if you'd like. Um, oh, you mean uh, show, show, show what we have? Oh, good question. How lovely. So, all I did was I screen shared um, the through iPhone, iPad AirPlay, um, oh. and then uh, the which I can enable screen share, so you can do that. <laughs> um, if that's what I want to do. 
Um, and then I literally just took my camera out and did that. So for anybody who tries to do a live show, um, if you want to have a second camera angle, um, it's actually really easy. Okay. Would I need to call into this? Yeah. Not really happy. No, you don't have to. <laughs> it's super simple. Um, and I'm actually going to explain it because I'm sure people who might be watching this uh, or would watch this um, might want to know because it's actually really handy. Uh, all you do, so on the Zoom app, um, on, on your computer, you don't need to do, do anything on your phone yet. Um, you press share screen. Okay. And then from there, go, you should, you might have an option. If you don't, then you, then you might not have it set it up, but it, you should have an iPhone, iPad via AirPlay option. Oh, I do. Okay. And then you do that. And then you have to go to your phone and press screen mirroring, and then Zoom should be an option. But I'm not on Mac. It might not matter. Do I need to have my Bluetooth or anything on? You probably do, yes. Oh, well, was I supposed to click share here? Wait. A plugin is required to share an iPad, I screen. Oh, apparently you need a plug-in. I've been doing it for so long that I don't even think about it. <laughs> I think on a Windows computer you need a plug-in. Oh well. Oh well. It works on Apple probably. Um, but anyways, sorry like, for the interruption. <laughs> that's all right. Uh, what was I talking about? I was rambling about um, uh, working uh, composing music, working to picture. Yeah. And how that, you know, sort of appeals to me. That sort of, um, it's a, it's just a, it's like a, it's kind of like a writing prompt. I just made a mess. <laughs> oh, no. oh no. This is why. How that happened? This is why, this is the towel, that's what the towel is for. I drop my hash browns into my <laughs> mixture. But, I didn't make that big of a mess. Yeah, no, the, all of this is a learning process for people at home. I will say the everything that I've been doing on this show, I keep learning new things about myself that I didn't know. Um, <laughs> learning, you know, I mean, I knew that I was a messy cook. Yeah. Uh, I'm definitely realizing how much of a messy cook I am. <laughs> um, I uh, realized, oh, Oh, I didn't test it. It's alive. Oh, hello. Hello, friends. Well, you're welcoming uh, my good <laughs> friends, Takia and Kendra. Hi, we're just, uh, give us one second, we'll join. <laughs> Video. Hi. Hello. hello. Welcome. <laughs> Nice to be here. Nice, nice to meet you. you. Uh, this is, uh, um, these are my good friends, uh, Kendra and Kakia. Uh, Hi. Where are you streaming from? We're in Chicago actually right now at my sister's house and we're just gonna set up uh, a little bit better so we can see y'all. Okay. Um, yeah, no, um, I know Kendra and Kakia from Michigan State University, which is where we all go to school. Um, uh, Kendra is a really wonderful saxophonist who I've had the very wonderful pleasure of working with um, on a piece that I wrote. It was actually one of the last pieces that I've had performed li like live, um, which is really, really wonderful. Although I wasn't there and I'm really sad about that. <laughs> it's uh, okay, it's okay. It was I our pleasure. And it was great. Uh, <laughs> it was our pleasure. Thank you so much for, for writing that for Charlie and I. Absolutely. And then uh, Kakia is starting her DMA in composition in the fall at Michigan State University. Um, but she just finished her master's in composition at Michigan State University. That's awesome. Um, wonderful, wonderful composer. And the two of them collaborate together on really, really wonderful things. Um, but they also have their own projects that they do individually. Um, Takia, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're from? who you are, what you do, what, what's your music making process? Of course, um, I am from Greece. <clears throat> I, 
I came to the US by mistake, I, I, I guess. Hey, I said, <laughs> they gave him some money, so I came here. Um, my music, uh, I don't know if I can, uh, if I'm that mature to define it with one word or two, but I'm, I think I'm kind of trying to uh, create, to combine East and West. Uh, being from Greece, we are exactly at the center of, in the middle, I should say, uh, of, uh, Eastern influences and Western influences. So I guess I'm uh, unconsciously uh, doing that as well. And then I'm also very interested uh, in visuals. I have a film degree, so I'm trying to create um, different narratives, uh, combining certain visual aspects, certain filmic aspects, I should say, with, with music, contemporary, at least compositions. Um, that's all I, I would say. <coughs> Okay. Uh, um, what, what kind of projects are you working on right now? Now, I, I'm going to just change our, because it has better lighting. Sorry, we were just going to change stuff around just a little bit so we can have better lighting for you all. Oh, yeah, for sure. This is very casual, y'all. And I'm, I intentionally want these live shows to be somewhat casual because sometimes, like, I really, like, for me, the thing that's really important to me um, is connection and there's like a performative aspect of, of doing something like this. And that's something I kind of want to avoid. Um, <laughs> I want- Oh, awesome. Okay. Yeah. okay, we like casual. We're good with casual. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyways, uh, so yeah, what, what kind of projects were you working on, Katya? Um, I just finished my master's thesis, which was the, the first uh, main study for me a, of creating this kind of different narratives between uh, film and uh, and music. I did the film uh, as well as the composition, of course. And now I'm actually working in a similar project, <clears throat> but with electronics and footage from Athens. Uh, I'm, I'm in the process of asking people from Athens to send me uh, footage <laughs> from their lives, not only from the city, but for when, since they were kids, like personal footage. And I'm trying to create this um, this piece where um, we will try to actually get into a, a city and understand the city through the personal experiences of, of its inhabitants. Um, that's what I'm doing right now, I think. That's great. Also, um, uh, our duo between podcast yes. compositions and she runs electronics and also creates these short films, which are really great. And I play saxophone um, <laughs> and, <laughs> and make weird sounds. Uh, we just had a premiere of um, the piece that we played at NASA in Arizona for New Music Gathering last night. And we can um, like share the link with anyone who's interested for that. But I think it went, went over really well. And so our duo name is like Electo Duo. And we're trying to do more with uh, combining the saxophone and electronics and telling these electroacoustic um, stories and visuals. Yes. Um, so it's really exciting. Yeah, I think it, it went over pretty well. And we're excited about continuing that in the future, expanding on it and definitely trying to do more with yeah. the saxophone, visuals, electronics. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. That's actually kind of, I'm doing similar things right now. Um, oh, what? I just finished a project um, called Colorful Clouds, which was a video graphic score. Um, nice. uh, and uh, it was partly because I was really struggling to write notes on a page um, because just like where I've, my headspace has been at recently has just been very much like, all I really want to go and do is go on walks and enjoy the weather. Um, mm -hmm. Because like I've been here all by myself, which my partner will be here tomorrow. Yay, so nice. Really excited about it. Um, he was actually supposed to be here today for this, but he didn't make it. Um, <laughs> the, but, uh, um, but yes, he's on the road. Um, but yeah, no, I, I uh, the thing I really loved about um, Kakia, I'm gonna just put Kakia on a, on a, on a thing here. Is just, oh, wow. like, <laughs> thank you. I think yeah, that nothing. the way that Kakia thinks about the visual aspect of the thing and, and the and the audio aspect of thing um, is just something very really special that I've always, I've really loved getting to know over the last um, over the last uh, year and a half um, or two years now I guess I'm glad I'm glad Spencer you like <laughs> I yeah, yeah, I, I love what you do and then and then but then the duo that you two have together um, 
like is just so it, it's just something that like I haven't heard before um and and there's like this the way that you two play together is so like you have so much stage presence together um, oh nice we're yeah, like, like, first time to make myself invisible that's why I was <laughs> no no I mean I mean Kendra is also just like a spectacular saxophonist. Oh, you're too, <laughs> you're too kind. Yeah, you know, I, 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 I am, yeah. you know, she has played my music before, so <laughs> um, she made my music sound good. So, you know, that's- No, no, it was my pleasure. It was really my pleasure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, what was that? And hopefully to play more, of course. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I, uh, I've uh, really definitely, I love working with you and I, and I love knowing both of you and I'm so happy that you're here on this show. Thank uh, you for having us, of course. Yeah. It's well, very interesting to see you uh, cooking and being such a, a very good presenter. Yes, yeah. <laughs> this is awesome. So, uh, yeah, I'm making hash browns right now. Is it really loud over there? Oh, no, oh, no, 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 no. Okay, cool. Uh, so, um, so uh, I, I don't know if you, how much you heard of uh, what Darian was talking about, because um, uh, Darian also uh, works um, in visual media. Um, uh, he he's on the. He, <laughs> I, I can let Darian talk for himself, actually. Sure. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, so I'm primarily uh, uh, into uh, TV and film uh, scoring. So. Okay. Um, I, you know, work with several directors um, and producers. And, um, um, I've got a couple of credits, uh, some stuff on Netflix, that kind of thing. Oh, wow. Uh, oh, man. Well, congratulations. I won the two. I'm jealous. <laughs> she, she actually has a, a film degree, so she... <laughs> oh, well, yeah, maybe we can collaborate sometime. Yes, please. Um, um, but, uh, but yeah, so that's, we, I was just, uh, just before you, um, you both came on, I was talking, uh, with, uh, Spencer about, um, um, what it's like, why I enjoy working, um, off of, uh, working off of a, a moving picture rather than just like mm. being completely free. Like I had, I like having some kind of, um, parameters like set upon me. Um, mm -hmm. self-imposed or sometimes it's even easier for me when it's like an external force. Like, I see. It makes sense. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. The more restrictions you have, the more creative you become, I believe. Yeah. Uh, it becomes yeah. more, it becomes a nice challenge. And, uh, cause I find, I mean, I personally, you know, when I'm completely, you know, unrestricted, <laughs> I often just get uh, nowhere. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's the tyranny of the blank yeah. page. Yeah. Yeah. It makes total sense to me. Yeah. Your cat is adorable. Man, we, uh, I'm yeah, trying to I be serious can't. here and like, <laughs> not <laughs> sure that I'm going crazy about this <laughs> kitty there, but, <laughs> oh my gosh. He, you. Likes, he loves to be held. He's almost a dog. <laughs> oh, he's so cute. He definitely cuddled with me when I was at your house. So oh, yeah, he'll cuddle with it, it with anybody. This is a perfect cat, guys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's been it's been nice. Like the thing I really loved about this show is is getting to hang out with all these people who I know and don't get to see. Um, and <laughs> you all know me probably well enough to know that me not seeing people is really challenging for me. Oh, yes, um, yes, yes. And so this has been really, it's been, this is one of my ways I've been coping and, and it's been, it's actually like, it, it totally blossomed into way more than I thought it would be um, <laughs> in so many wonderful ways. And it, it's been like fun and I've been excited about it. And um, the, and I appreciate you all for agreeing to being, being involved. Are you kidding? It's our pleasure. Yes. Definitely our pleasure, yes. Fine. My ash browns are almost done. So, D Darian, how did you go about this business? Is it as uh, gruesome as they say about about? Yeah, it? that's not very forgiving. I mean, I have to, like, I have to be honest with you. Like, mm -hmm. it's it's a lot of um, it's a lot of relationships and a lot of mm -hmm. just being lucky enough to know somebody who was somewhere, you know, was was nowhere at one point, and then, you know managed to get something sold and brought on that's what happened with me i mean the 
the the guys that I work with, um, and I say, you know, it's, they're all they're all men. <laughs> um, uh, they, uh, I, you know, I've known them since, um, gosh, almost a decade and a half ago. Um, uh, we had never actually met in person. They were students up in Boston at uh, Emerson University. And, and um, I started, I was in New York, I'm, you know, via email and telephone and, uh, you know, messaging, like, I would basically score their student films, you know, from my bedroom, uh, basically. And, uh, you know, from there, we just had developed a, a very good working relationship. And so then, you know, when one of them um, finally, you know, like back in 2017, so this is like more than a decade later. Wow. One of them finally, you know, got a series sold to Netflix mm. and had to really fight to bring me on because this was his, you know, first <laughs> big credit. And so they, you know, it was, uh, but but he did buy for me, which I'm hmm. super grateful for. Um, but you know, yeah, it's it's rough. Like you know, it takes a long time, and it's a lot of, uh, you know, it's a lot of thankless work before you get to do something um, that you really like to do. I mean, I still do a lot of. I still make you know, like half of my living, uh, you know, scoring like television commercials, which is, mm. I mean, you know, it is, it is what it, it is what it is. Um, you know, you have to, that's literally a, you know, that's a bill paying job. Yeah. Hmm. Um, so well, that sounds great to me. Yeah. What can you do, you know? Yeah. You've worked very hard. So, uh, and you're making a living out of it, which for me is a dream, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's something I'm very, very lucky that, uh, so far, you know, I'm like, where's some wood? I mean, uh, wood. Uh, so far, I am, you know, keeping my head above water uh, <laughs> without a day job, which is. <laughs> That's great. That is beautiful. Yeah, I, I will say, so I, uh, Darian's the only person that I haven't met in, in this room, but I've known Darian via Zoom uh, chats uh, for a few months now. Um, yeah. But uh, I've known who he is for a while, much longer than that, because I've known Dennis for a couple of years now. Yeah. Um, the we we do a composer uh, like happy hour thing, which we haven't done in a while. We need to yeah need to get on that because um, I miss you all. Um, but uh, it, I will say that when I met I met Darian like in March, I think, um, and uh, I immediately was like. Wow, I wish I would have known you for like years, because like, <laughs> just, like the sweetest person. Um, oh. and, I, and I'm saying this like from the perspective of like I was in a bad place in March. Um, I think many people were, but like, um, like I, I think for me specifically, just to get a little personal here, that like being alone in a house by myself, <laughs> you know, the person that I've been with for ten years without yeah. the ability to go home to my family without knowing when that was going to be. Um, mm -hmm. And then not knowing when we were going to see each other next, which, you know, we thought would be much sooner than it ended up being. Um, yeah. And like, Darian immediately just kind of like read that and, and was very, very sweet. Um, and I, ever since then, I'm just like, I want to know Darian more. So it's a- <laughs> Thanks. That's wonderful. That is I like to know you more. <laughs> <laughs> my hash browns look amazing, so I'm going to stick them in my pan. Of course they do. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I actually changed uh, changed recipes. Uh, it's very similar to, well, I guess it's not that similar, because um, I don't have to cook my hash browns. <laughs> um, I, when I sent, sent you this recipe, Spencer, um, I actually didn't send you the one that I'd made before. I thought it was. <laughs> Um, because I, I lost the paper. So uh, I found the original recipe. Uh, it's close. So I don't have to cook mine. And I just have to like, throw it in the, the oven. Nice. <laughs> uh, I was supposed to spray that. Yeah. Spencer, how long do you have to bake yours? Um, I have actually no idea. So I'm just going to keep checking on it. 
<laughs> um, but it's about 30 to 45 minutes. Okay, ours is uh, 30. So we'll, we'll pop ours in when you pop yours in. Yeah, I'm <clears throat> meant to spray this ahead before I put them in the Pyrex, and then I forgot to spray it. Um, <laughs> you know, I know what I'm doing. Um, although I have, I have actually cooked for Kakia and, and Kendra before. So I, and it was good. amazing. We devoured everything. It was good. <laughs> it was good. Uh, our friend Keaton still has the Tupperware that I gave him. Calling <laughs> yeah, him out on, on yeah. live. <laughs> yeah. Well, she, so he, yeah. He, he, yeah. One saxophonist has Tupperware of mine. Um, <laughs> so I, I'm not actually complaining. I have way too much Tupperware. But uh, the last time, uh, the I was supposed to do a live cheesecake show, um, but we ended up pausing that uh, for because uh, that was the the week um, that George Floyd was murdered. Um, so mm -hmm. I I pushed my show back a week, and I also paused the live show, and we just haven't had time to reschedule that yet. Mm -hmm. um, just because I felt like that wasn't the right time to to do that type of show. Mm -hmm. um, That's a good and, uh, Yeah, I agree. But uh, we, uh, um, okay, I'm, I'm going to put my cheese on, and then I'm going to put the egg in, and then I'm going to put more cheese on, and then it's going to be delicious. There we go. Perfect. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but anyways, yeah, uh, I made all this cheesecake um, prepping for that episode, right? <laughs> um, with, uh, I, Dennis knows Mary-Kate, probably. Um, do you know Mary-Kate McNally? Uh, we've never met. You never, oh, okay. Um, very good friends with Jen. Uh, met her at Midwest uh, oh, maybe uh, two years ago. Maybe. Uh, I think yes. Yeah. So we were gonna we were gonna make cheesecake together. Um, and uh, but we ended up canceling it. Um, but I had all this cheese. I made like three cheesecakes. Like it was just like wow. a dumb amount of cheesecake. So I gave <laughs> Jeff uh, Long and Eric Zang, who will be not this week's episode, but the following week's episode, um, I gave them a cheesecake because I was like, I do not need this amount of cheesecake. <laughs> <laughs> yes. The, and it's, if uh, Kakia can attest, uh, and, and uh, Kendra can attest, they like their, their food. Oh, the, oh, for sure. I'm sure that cheesecake was Dead. <laughs> gone. <laughs> Just gone. <laughs> yeah. The, but anyways, uh, let's, uh, let's, uh, talk about something else. Um, so uh, this is a Pride-themed episode. Um, and I know I wanted to start off and just let you all introduce yourself because first off, the, the four of you don't know each other. Um, the, and uh, I felt like that was important. Um, but uh, also, like, context, like, why are you on the show? Um, yeah. the, but it's a Pride brunch. So um, I guess my question for you um, for, for, and I feel free to jump in, um, like, what do you normally, what would you normally do for, for a pride, like during pride? Uh, drink a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, what did we do last year? We just, we hung out with our friends and we just yeah. went down to, I, I finished a recording session of I was oh, turning yeah. pages for a solo piano album of David Del Tredici. Right. Um, so I, I was coming back from Danbury, Connecticut, uh, and got to join the festivities late, basically just in time to have dinner and everybody go home. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I missed it. Yeah, last year was uh, supposed, you know, uh, in New York, supposedly significant ish because it was 50 50th year, year 50th anniversary stonewall oh, I see. Mm -hmm. last year um and it felt like a big you know yeah it was world prize it's a but huge, it's huge huge party um you know obviously this year feels a little bit different um um not just because we're you know not just because the parades are canceled um I, with everything that's going on in this country um and around the world it just it, there's something uh, a little weightier uh, going down. Um, at least in, that's just my feeling about it. Um, I don't know if you know anyone else shares it, but 
but yeah. Um, how does it feel? How does it feel to you all? Uh, definitely the same. I mean, I guess to answer Spencer's question first, uh, we would definitely also uh, be drinking or um, <laughs> at some party or something like that. Yeah, last year we were, uh, she's from Greece. And so last year we were there for the parade. And um, then a wonderful after pride party, which is just mind blowing. And oh, oh I'm putting great. my, my yeah. bathroom in Dennis. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> um, which they do have a great after pride parade party where you go into this uh you know abandoned building and it's great you have dj and lighting and everyone's crowded into this space and uh it's hot and it's <laughs> yeah beautiful so that's probably what would have happened this yeah. year but but now we're still in london yeah <laughs> and also considering just pandemic and then everything else that's been happening in the past three weeks um yeah it's definitely a lot weightier i mean yeah pandemic isolates us and since george floyd's killing and the protests and juneteenth and all of these events uh it's just it's a lot it, mm -hmm. it's a, a state of despair for me so it's um you know, trying to find ways to still celebrate and be happy about the things you have is nice, yeah. but it's difficult, I think, it, it, for me especially, but yeah. I feel that, I, yeah. you know, I've been having a hard time myself. Um, yeah, it's, it's been a rough, rough few months. Mm -hmm. And it feels like, uh, I mean, it feels like it's been, it feels like it's been way longer than a few months. <laughs> yeah, really. Um, so yeah. I feel like with all the protests and everything, it it, it is a, a reminder of you know the first Pride protests, and yeah. so it kind of brings us back to that those roots. So you know, yeah, and they actually felt a bit nice about the protests. No, I mean, I love that we've gotten so much global support and that the protests have spread so far. I mean, it's great. We went to the one in, in Lansing, Michigan. Um, but, you know, that doesn't take away from the fact that, like, there's still very serious issues that, oh, yeah. that need to be addressed. And, you know, the killing, George, George Floyd's killing, Breonna Taylor's killing, just all of these things that have happened over the years, it's hitting hard, you know. Like, yeah. It, it's, just digging that do that hole even deeper. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's <laughs> it's been uh, tough. <laughs> yeah, it's disheartening. I mean, it's encouraging and disheartening at the same time. I mean, here in New York to see, uh, especially. I mean, uh, the and this is happening all over the country. But like, you know, the, the the fact that you know we desperately, desperately need to get a hold of you know, to get some measure of control over our situation with, you know, policing in this country. And in New York, it's proving to be very um, difficult even now, like for our elected officials to have that kind of political will to do what needs to be done. The NYPD is so insular here and so mm. just like, mm. Uh, they, clo you know, they just, the way they close ranks mm -hmm. and the way that they behaved through the, like, the, through the protests, um, mm -hmm. and just, you know, I mean, you, you, I mean, just video after video of them, you just can't believe the lives of people. I mean, that's very, that's been hard for me to watch. Um, I can only imagine <laughs> what, like, it's like for the people actually out there. Um, so, but yeah, as you say, you know, like seeing, seeing like a Black Lives Matter demonstration in a place like, you know, Paris or Tokyo, like I, I just, I never, you know, yeah, I never thought I'd see something like that. So that part feels different to me somehow. I hope it does at least. I mean, you know, yeah, if something changes, I hope something changes. Definitely, it's I, it's 
I think that's the most heartwarming part is how global it, it has become, how mm. the uprising has hit different places, Syria. Yeah. You know, I mean, like places with, of course, their own systemic and systematic issues still found the time and the energy and the will and all of these things to show up and speak out. And if that doesn't like encourage someone out there to get yeah. their shit together, mm -hmm. uh, to also do the same thing, you know, to stop uh, and realize that their individual issues don't necessarily outweigh um, the global issues, systemic mm -hmm. issues, issues that affect all people. Yeah. And I don't know what will, you know, like if, <laughs> if that's right. That's it's like, like, what will it take? Like, yeah. And, you know, I mean, that's the, kind of the scary part of this because if, if I mean, if something was going to change the system in, in a way that like makes, you know, sense for people, like I would have thought that it would have to be something like this. And if not this, then, then you know, as you, you're right, what, what, would, what would it take? Um, yeah, everyone vote. Vote, vote in November. Everyone vote. Yeah, vote. In vote. November. <laughs> Wait, yeah, they, <laughs> vote is fine. Vote well, don't vote, it's fine. Well. <laughs> Please vote. Yeah. Don't just vote in November, vote in every election. Yeah, oh yes, of course. <laughs> well, yeah. well, I have to say, one of the reasons why I asked Kendra and Kakia on the show was because I was trying to think of like, who would have a really good conversation with, with the two of you. Um, because the show started off with Dennis and Darian. Um, and I just started thinking, like, and because Dennis had, had signed up to want to be on the show. And I was trying to think of, beyond just the fact that I wanted him on the show, um, I was trying to figure out something that like is super Dennis. Um, and uh, I don't know, I was like the, the immediate thing uh, that, I, that I thought of was that Dennis is, Dennis is that person at, at uh, when I see him where I'm like totally, like my whole guard goes down, like, about my own like queerness just because um he's like one of the few people that uh that i know in contemporary music not that there aren't others because there are plenty of others mm -hmm. but i hadn't met them yet um but they uh that who is just who who seems to not do the whole performative like closeted i'm queer but i'm gonna pretend i'm not type of thing um, I have the energy for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, but the thing, but as I got to know Dennis and Darian a little bit more, um, you know, and, and here are the things that they're passionate about and, and that they, they like to talk about, um, it reminded me of the last dinner that uh, Kendra and Takia and I had with, with a bunch of other people um, where we spent like two and a half hours talking about, <laughs> you know, the politics of, I don't even remember what. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I just remember it got heated, um, and it was. But it was. It was definitely a. It was definitely a really enjoyable evening because that's definitely that's how I grew up. Actually, was having those types of conversations. Heated in a good way. Oh, it, it was a nice heat. Of yeah. course, a good heat. It was a nice heat. Yeah, it, it got heated, but like I grew up having heated conversations with my family because Jewish culture is like if you're not interrupting someone, you're not like you're not paying attention right <laughs> second whatever you're thinking don't sorry <laughs> are you talking to your cat yeah okay. what a cutie <laughs> he just he's because there's just, we had to bring our computer speakers and subwoofer out into the kitchen because the internal um laptop speakers weren't going to cut it and so he's sit sitting on the subwoofer <laughs> and looking at the kitchen counter in the sink, especially. And I'm just like, better <laughs> not. Happens. He's planning <laughs> something. <laughs> oh, I see him. Oh, look at him. He's gorgeous. Oh. <laughs> he just wanted to see. He was like, yeah, yeah. like what's up there? <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprised he hasn't been like vocal yet. Uh, <laughs> vocal cat. He was, um, oh my god, you got the you perfect know, cat. Oh, um, 
Yeah. Well, I, we were talking I, about heated conversations I, and oh, yeah. talking yeah. family and things like that. And I mean, yeah. talk to in pain. Those are the conversations uh, we live for. <laughs> That's what I mean. Yeah. yeah. That's what I mean. <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm scene changing because we're done. I'm done cooking. So, <laughs> uh, uh, and what's brunch if you're not at a table? Right. Hmm. Um, okay. So, um, yeah, no, the, the tough conversations are definitely a, uh, um, can sometimes also be the ones that are really enjoyable to have when you're, w particularly when you're having them with people that you really respect and admire. Um, and, um, you know, it's not a, like, the, even if you have a disagreement, which there are tons of disagreements we, we have, right? Um, like, Kakia says things all the time. I'm like, what? But but seriously, like I know that that uh, when her and I have a conversation, that there's a mutual respect that um, that opinions are you know that these things are fluid, right? Um, and if you go in with into the conversation with an open mind, um, with somebody that you admire and respect, you can have a thoughtful conversation with someone and and both grow from it. Definitely. Mm. I mean, we're basically in the same on the same side. Our core values are the same. It's, mm -hmm. it's details and yeah, policies maybe that mm -hmm. you know who cares about them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so. I had to get my drink. Um, the, the, yeah, absolutely. I, I completely, I completely agree. Um, I will say one of the things, com completely unrelated, because I mentioned my drink. Um, one of the things that's coming up with this show, um, coming up in the next couple of weeks, um, is I'm planning on adding a cocktails with creatives monthly show. Um, there's a number of people that I know that are like, I don't cook, but I really want to be involved with your show. <laughs> um, and I, I felt like, you know, someone who really enjoys a cocktail and the conversation part um, is also totally valid. And um, because, and it's related, the reason why I bring this up is because it's about that conversation. And if somebody wants to have a good conversation with me, I want to have a good conversation with them back. Yeah, um, of course. Yes, yes. So look forward to cocktails with creatives in the future. Um, yes, yes. yes. Um, anyways, so um, now that the, the casseroles are in the oven, um, the, uh, you know, the mimosas are, are still happening um, for, for some of us. Um, <laughs> the, um, I left mine in the kitchen. I'll, I'm going to go get it. Yes. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, Dennis is getting so uh, I'll, I'll focus on Kendra and Kakia for now. Um, so um, tell me a little bit about um, the, how did the two of you know each other? Oh, um, <laughs> we met at University of Minnesota. So uh, it was a dark, dark day. <laughs> <laughs> I did two degrees there. And during my master's in, in saxophone performance, um, she was starting her master's in composition. Uh, coming from Greece, of course, and we met in a, <laughs> I shouldn't say stupid, but stupid theory class, <laughs> and, <laughs> and uh, you know, it met at 8 a.m., the awful hours of the morning, where you are not yourself yet, not ready to flirt at all, you're not ready, <laughs> you're not ready to see people, or flirt, or have a conversation, um, so anyway, yeah, we met there, and, you know, mid-semester, I don't know, uh, something like this, we began speaking, I guess, because we would always arrive to this class around the same time, and, like, I ended up listening to something she was playing on her headphones, and it was, like, uh, what was Mississippi it? Blues. It was Mississippi Blues, and I was, like, what do you know about this <laughs> music? Like, where did you hear this? Like, what are you listening to? So that's kind of how um, the conversation kicked off, and we started to know each other bit so and yeah it's been uh and then she decided to leave so i had to leave too <laughs> yeah. so no. i left minnesota 
And I, I didn't did. decide to leave. I graduated. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. And, and I'm very, very glad I left Minnesota and I came here because the, there's no comparison between the two departments, composition. And so I followed you here and here we are now. You're in Michigan. Yeah. And I met I met the two of you after I'm gonna say the word stupid theory thing because it was <laughs> a theory thing. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, I met the two of them at a um, at like a theory pre test type of thing, like yeah. entrance exam. Um, and I remember very I remember very specifically uh, meeting the two of you and and uh, being like I really like the two of you and I want to know more. Um, and like it, uh, I feel like over the course of the last two years has just been like, I will say to anybody who, who cares, like, uh, you know, no university is perfect. Every university has, you know, its fair share of issues, but the community that is, exists here with among the students um, is something that I really value. And I've never seen anywhere of the other universities that I've been at. Um, okay. And I'm very, very fortunate. Huh. Hmm. I do like our community, yeah. Yeah, very and, much. Yeah, I just didn't. I thought it was a common thing. I think it was even different in Minnesota. Like, I don't. We had our group of people, no, we didn't have it. but it wasn't. I think as close as this, you know, where we have people we can talk to and, and do these things with and have heated conversations with, and then still love each other. So, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yes, yeah. 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 So, um, on that same, before I have Darren and Dennis tell how they know each other. Um, the I, I also want to know just like being in contemporary slash classical slash whatever we want to call um our community um like how has you know being part of this community that we're celebrating right now um ha ha how has that affected you choices or um you know persona or anything you start. <laughs> um, I think there is a, a comfort level in it that's really nice that just allows, I think, myself and I, Kaki, I assume as well, to be free to do what we want. But I don't really like, for me, my mentality is I'm my identity, who I am as a person, uh, cannot really be uh, hidden when I'm talking about uh, the fact that I'm a woman and that I'm black you know and so because of this I don't have this mentality of you need to hide any person uh any aspect of yourself so contemporary music whatever it may be like my world of classical music or contemporary saxophone music saxophone music whatever label it is is predominantly white and male but at the same time I give like these many f's about that you know like it's not gonna stop me from doing what I want to do or being in the field. I don't let the fact that like, because I am black, I need to play only jazz or I need to play only popular music. Um, I think the two work really well together. You know, it's like, yeah, we've got, we have black opera singers. We've got all kind of uh, black classical musicians and, you know, to fill out this circle of, uh, you know, black woman, <laughs> uh, queer, gay, lesbian, and also uh, in classical music is uh, it's probably weird for a lot of people, but for me, I'm chilling. I'm like, yeah, that's uh, it's my world. So it's nice to have a community of people though that also are just like, this is me, this is my identity, this is who we are. Um, you know, you want to play my music? Great. If you don't, great. You know, if you want to listen to my music or be friends with me or in my ideas, great. If you don't, great. You know, like I've got, I've got people. So I think the support is great. The community is great. And I appreciate, you know, Spencer and Katya and all of our friends and the MSU community, because I think the vibe is the same amongst people. I think, you know, of course you always have people that don't agree probably with what I'm saying, but um, I think they're too afraid to come talk to us. Well, Kendra is one of the coolest people that I know, so... You're a good guy. <laughs> so she's intimidating. No, I'm just no, a nerd. I'm, she's actually not. She's really wonderful and beautiful. Um, I and might be intimidating. I mean, you know, sometimes... Someone that I adore. Anyways. Um, Thank you. What about you, Kakia? Excuse me? What about, what about you? I, I don't know, Spencer, it's an interesting question, and I've been thinking about it all, all the time that Kendra was like, because I came from a place where, well, 
life is pretty unbearable <laughs> uh, in terms of uh, creating artists uh, of people who want to do things and want to, to you know collaborate and stuff there's not none of these things happening in Greece I mean there are some people are really struggling and they don't get paid for what they do and stuff like that but the majority is comprises of people that I hated that's why I rarely com collaborated with people <laughs> from that country so so when I came here and uh, I I actually started pondering on this community, contemporary music community thing. I found myself that I don't know if I'm actually a part of it, really. I, I don't know. I, because because I don't have the background that you guys have. Uh, like I started at some point uh, seriously uh, studying music, but I'll never call myself a classical performer. I'll never call, say that, oh, I wake up and I put Mozart to, you know, <laughs> feel wonderful. I don't. I might put Bach, but, you know, that's like on the off days. Um, so I don't know. I think I think that um, I just like to piss people off a lot. And, she, uh, <laughs> she definitely does. <laughs> <laughs> she does. I just really love it. Like, I didn't know what a contemporary community of contemporary musicians is like until I came here I hadn't really imagined of this entity so when I came and I saw that the majority are like white people or white men and uh, like I started learning things about that and then we went to a NASA convention and I started laughing at people <laughs> for, for they, what they were trying to show off or like the nonsense that we were listening to for 15 minutes. A disclaimer here, she means aesthetics mostly, that yeah. there seems to be this relationship between someone's uh, gender and probably sexuality identity and perhaps the music they choose to play and I think perhaps okay I'm, I'm being uh, welcoming and I think this helping happens for me, I experience it in the saxophone community, uh, meaning that, you know, there seems to be this masculinity attached to everything that <laughs> people want to play, um, which for me, I've been like, I don't really care, like just doing my own thing. And I think people like to label certain musicians, especially women, uh, as being soft or they only want to play melody or they only want to play like a lullabies or something. And it's like, nah, like just because we don't want to listen to or she doesn't want to write or I don't want to play necessarily music that only screams look at me I'm very masculine and I can jump around and do acrobats yeah, yeah. Um, doesn't make me less of a musician and so we're basically I think I think you correct me if I'm wrong we're both on the team where we're like um, we're gonna do what we want aesthetically we're not gonna follow in this box that everyone seems to be following kind of not everyone but a lot of people we encounter just for the sake of doing it, just for the sake of saying you can. Um, and so, yeah. So it was very like pleasing when we went and, and um, I, I, when I wrote this this piece, it's called Morning and it has like Audrey Lord speaking and like demonstrations, some, some design of demonstrations and stuff. I didn't know that that was like, I don't know, you know, it's, it's normal coming from Greece where everyone is politi highly politicized. And we talk about politics all the time and stuff. So when I came here, I thought that was, ah, you know, one of the many things that <laughs> might happen. And then I, we went to NASA and I saw these things and I'm like, Kendra, I, I will enjoy it so much when we're going to play this. Uh, like, like, I just want to, I just want to be, you know, the black queer person in a room full of um, uh, Mike Pence's, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Closeted gay. Okay. So nice you know, to do. <laughs> um, I will say, like, one of the reasons why I asked Kendra um, and Charlie, uh, Charlie Hall, um, the to play to if I could write them something was because I felt like I could. A lot of my music is either social commentary or like political commentary, um, and we we started talking, and the thing that there's the saxophone community has kind of a reputation for being you know louder faster stronger harder like and that's like how saxophone music works right um and anybody who plays saxophone they probably agree with that that statement 
Um, and that's not necessarily true that that's what everybody's doing, but that's definitely the, the vibe that you get when you go. Um, and here are two performers who, who I know who, while can do all of those things, um, <laughs> they choose to take their own path and do what they want and make cho musical choices based off of what they love doing, not because what makes them look good, right? Um, and that creates the sense of like, I, I hate the word authenticity, but like it creates a word of like a, a, this feeling of like you, you're doing what you care about. And that, that is compelling um, to engage with. That's in compelling material to engage with. Um, so I really appreciate, appreciate that. And I completely agree um, partly the last, I mean, one of the, the last movement of that, of the piece that I wrote for them, which was called Economic Shorts, um, <laughs> was like, I think the last movement was titled, the president doesn't determine the current state of the economy, I think it was the name of the movement. Um, <laughs> um, and like, I'm very, like, I, I tend to not be super metaphorical when it comes to political statement type pieces, because I feel like trying to use metaphor um, when you're trying to actually say something people might not get it. And I like to be pretty clear um, where where my intentions are. Um, but anyways, um, I wanna move on to, to Dennis and Darian. Um, can you tell us just a little bit about where did you meet? How do you know each other? Um, how do you talk now? No, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, we, uh, we met in, in our um, early slash mid twenties uh, should be about 15 years ago, and um, uh, we, I was a grad student, Dennis had just recently moved to New York to study with um, a private composition teacher um, who I was basically, I had basically vacated his studio uh, to be in school, and Dennis took over my yeah. spot. Yeah, I, uh, I had just finished undergrad <clears throat> at Illinois State, and um, didn't get into grad school right away because I didn't get much help on my application and especially my portfolio. So uh, no one had been, at that point managed to drill into my brain that you have to present your music well in order to be taken seriously. So I sent like single-sided, uh, unbound, just with a paperclip, like scores off to all these schools. And of course they said, no. Uh, so I, I had known this composer. I, I, um, sent me an email, said, what do I do? And he said, there's an opening in my studio, move to New York and take that spot in September. So I did. Um, the very first lesson that teacher was saying, you know, oh, you should meet Darian. Um, you know, he, he's just starting his master's right now. Um, he's really cute, you'll like him. And I'm like, I just moved here. <laughs> I have to get my, I have to get my bearings in this city. Um, I'm not, I'm, you know, I just got broken up with because I was moving. So like, I'm not ready for another relationship. Uh, and Darian, of course, was like, I just started my master's. Uh, I'm not ready for a relationship. So it was like a year and a half later, I think. Um, like I was starting a, a concert series in Manhattan and um, I was you know, putting together a whole program of art songs. And I knew that Darian had written a song cycle, so I, I wanted to, like, you know, we we met twice before three times, um, and so I just said, hey, you know, can we meet up? And I'll, I'd like to, you know, check out the cycle. Maybe I'll, I'll program it. Um, and it turned into, yeah, it, it, it's you know, like we both overslept, and so we were late <laughs> to getting together. <laughs> um, and because I've been at a, at a crazy party the night before. <laughs> um, and like, yeah, we, we met for lunch kind of late, um, listened to, you know, each other's music back at uh, Darian's apartment, yeah. turned into dinner. And it's just like, it just kept going. So mm -hmm. that was 15 years ago. It's, it's still going. Wow. It's, still, <laughs> it's still going. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, That's no, it, 15 years. Wow. Uh, nice. Yeah, I, you know, so I've been with my partner for 10 years. Oh, uh, We're the babies here. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, but we met when I was 19. And we, you know, 
I feel like he was the person that, like, for the first time in my entire life, like, and this sounds, like, now this sounds, like, super savvy, but, like, for the <laughs> first time in my whole life, it's, like, somebody who just, like, saw me, mm -hmm. and that wasn't, like, the experience that I had growing up. Um, I, like, again, don't have to hide. I'm, like, people, I'm a, I'm a people person. I like people, <laughs> but um, I was a people person that lived in Arizona, which, you know, growing up, being the the gay kid but who was like super closeted and super like it just was a bad experience right and and I was the weird kid and I'm I'm still kind of the weird kid um <laughs> but the the he was kind of the first person to just kind of like see me and give me like the time of day um that and, and like listen right and which yeah I probably have to check on my casserole yeah uh, the story but the um I'm gonna uh finish that but uh um yeah no I mean he was the he he just saw me and so it was really nice to to have that I was hoping he would be here um but obviously he is not but that's okay uh, <laughs> but uh oh, that looks amazing it's not quite done yet but it does look really good um how's ours is it done I'm going to grab my glass. I'll just hang out in here for a little bit until it's done. But uh, but yeah, no, it's uh, um, the. I'll wait till till Dennis gets back to um, to ask the follow up question. But the but yeah, I mean it's. Uh, I definitely it wasn't until I moved to New York because I did my master's at NYU where I um, kind of got to have this like start over moment um, where I just felt for the first time, nobody knows me here, right? And I know that like, that sounds super like TV where you're like, I'm gonna move to a new city and everything's gonna be great, right? right. And that's like only half true um, because you're still the same person. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, the, but, I, but moving there really did help me kind of figure out who I was. Um, and we did long distance during that time um, for two years, and, and it was very helpful for me to um, to kind of not have to uh, rely on him to like validate me. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like I got to be like, I'm gonna start like start from scratch. Nobody knows here. I don't have ten years of schooling history of people just thinking me as the weird kid. Um, and I will say, like the first that two years, it didn't. It wasn't all like dandelions and roses like it, it definitely took some time um but then fast flash for fast forward um i moved to seattle and had to do it again right but the difference was was that my partner was there um and i had already done the whole i figured out a little bit more about who i am and what i like and where where i'm at in life um and so but i had also already done the whole reinvent yourself thing mm -hmm. um and so when i moved to seattle I didn't know anybody, but I kind of knew how to like enter into a community and and just kind of like start from scratch and and try to figure out how to do that. And it was probably like one of the best experiences that I've had. Um, but it was also the first time that I like really felt a part of the you know LGBTQ plus community um, mm -hmm. because I lived in a very gay neighborhood. Um, Capitol Hill in Seattle is, is Seattle's neighborhood. It's, um, wow. Wow. and it, it, I lived in the heart of it. It's actually like right now it's where the heart of all the, all, of most of the protests in Seattle have been occurring. Um, like I was, uh, and there's right, even like a, the autonomous zone. The autonomous zone. Like literally I lived across the street from the autonomous zone. <laughs> um, so if I was still living there, I, I, you know, that would be an interesting experience. Um, <laughs> Uh, is what, as all I'll say, but uh, but anyways, yeah. As now that uh, Dennis is back, um, the so I, I want to ask you the same question that I asked Kendra and Kakia. Um, like, how has your? I mean, it, it seems like you had teachers who were pretty open minded. Um, but I'm just curious, like, how has working in music um, in your different areas? Um, has, has your own queerness affected 
anything at all um, and or how there's, you operate? There's something of a, I feel as though there's something of a tradition, at least for gay men to be composers. Um, it's not a tradition that I particularly care for because with <laughs> it comes a lot of um, uh, cliches about, you know, what kind of personality type you have to have. I mean, it's like when I think of a lot of, you know, gay men who were, I mean, not David, but like, you know, other gay men that age who were composers, it's a lot of, you know, I don't let my sexuality define me. I don't let it, to, I don't want to be considered a gay composer. I want to be a composer, you know, it's okay, all that kind of, all that, like, nonsense, all that stuff. Um, so I have to say that, you know, coming up, there was a lot of, you know, that, that mindset was pretty heavily drilled into my head. Mm -hmm. um, um, that changed uh, over time as I, you know, kind of got to know more um, LGBTQ composers, like, you know, as, as human beings, like, just with exposure and just, um, and, you know, realize that just, it's having that, like spending that kind of energy, like yeah, trying to, you know, trying to do that, you know, that kind of thing. It's just like, it, you know, it's a way of like trying to, you know, kind of deny yourself. Mm -hmm. I don't, I'm not interested in doing that anymore. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. What about, yeah, and I, I came up, I, I consider it late. I came out when I was 20, uh, you know, I was in undergrad. Um, and, you know, it was, I kind of came out and went into a relationship pretty quickly. And, you know, I, the way that I came out was like, I told a couple of people on like a Thursday or Friday before I went home to my parents for the weekend. I was like, okay, so like, at the time, you know, it was a, it was a, by now gay later kind of situation where you know like said bye but that was like the, a stepping stone um is the battery dying to no no i'm just uh, it uh, and you know but i said i'm going to tell my parents this weekend you know so the first thing i did was like like i'm inviting my parents to be a part of my life you know like i'm opening up to them um and you know they didn't take it great right away but they understood what I was telling them and why I was telling them. I was very explicit about that. Um, and so I felt pretty open from the beginning. That's just what I wanted. And then, you know, then as soon as I got back to school, I was like, okay, now this, this is a thing. <laughs> um, and then when I moved to New York, I was very fortunate to, you know, to meet a number of um, gay composers. Oh, man. Um, I think all white, um, and they were very, they were very welcoming, um, and, you know, I was really never interested in, like, once I came out, I'm like, why, am, why would I ever hide again? And so, like, a lot of my music has involved, you know, being gay, like, my first major song cycle, which is one of the pieces that, like, gets a lot of play of mine, like is about being gay. And, you know, the other big piece of mine that like gets the most play is um, a big soprano and orchestra piece about LGBT teenage suicide. Um, you know, it's something that I, like, I just kind of give a shit about the community. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, the first, review I ever got was in the New York Times because I put on a concert of um, songs by gay American composers. And, you know, like, it's just been something that I've always wanted to Even celebrate. Then, that was pretty man, like, that was pretty white and male. Too. It was, it was very white and male. Uh, 
I'll, I'll, I'll own that. <laughs> um, but like kind of at every turn, certain mentors have cautioned me against that um, un until recently. Um, but it, especially in those early years, you don't want to be pigeonholed as the um, game yeah. composer. Not only that, but as like a... we're talking about <laughs> we're talking about the like early aughts. Yeah. For when we were in um, college. And I mean, you know, talk about a boys' club. I mean, back then in in, in undergrad, I had no female uh, uh, composer. Like I no, there was not a not a one in my in I think the, the whole department. Um, and I mean, they were the, the way that some of these, you know, older male composers would just talk about, I mean, they would be, it would be literally like, women really, women can't really do this. Yeah. They would basically say that, like, they're like, I don't know, there's something constitutionally and that they're just, they're not cut out. And I would just, yeah, it's really, yeah, no, yeah. I, I, I really, you know, it's interesting that you talk about the, um, the lineage of gay white composers. Um, and if you actually, I've, I've actually done a little bit of research in this area. Um, the, there, there is, there's this kind of misconception about the serial wars and I'm using air quotes. Um, between um, serial composers and tonal composers. Um, and while, yes, it exists um, very openly, um, the, it, there's actually more subtext there, and it actually has to do with queerness. Um, the, if you look at the, the people who are getting the most airtime of the tonal composers, they're all gay. Yeah. Aaron Copeland, <laughs> Samuel Barber, um, later on, Ned Broram, John Croyano, um, like you have this like list of people who are all gay composers who, um, who all kind of created this community of support for one another. Um, and, you know, yes, it, it was very white. Um, and if you, as you learn more about queer history, you learn about really the separation between the white gay community and the non-white gay community. Um, and which is its own, it's, that's a whole different conversation, right? Yeah. Um, but it, it, uh, it, like the person I, like if I have to think of the composer who I think is, was one of the most interesting composers to me who does not get the same, uh, uh, particularly the most interesting like queer composers um, is Julius Eastman who totally gets overlooked like regularly, right? Um, but, uh, you know, I, I was very fortunate to have, um, a composition teacher um, during my master's who, you know, was actually very supportive in, um, you know, what I, the types of projects that I wanted to do for my master's thesis. I wrote an opera about coming out, um, which I, you know, I probably wasn't ready to write that opera um, and I <laughs> will never share it with anybody else. But the, uh, <laughs> Um, but the fact that he was even like supportive, even though he comes from a long line, he came from a long line of composer family. This is, uh, Justin De La Gioio. Um, the, you know, his father's Norman De La Gioio. Um, and I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but I'm going to, um, he has been described as frenemies with Samuel Barber. Um, <laughs> the, which I kind of love that idea. Um, so but the, basically either an enemy or a frenemy. What was that? Wasn't everybody either like an enemy or a frenemy? Of yeah, there's no friend, right? <laughs> Everybody's in it for themselves. But no, um, the, you know, he's very good friends with John Croyano. Um, I don't know if this is true. This is what he told me, um, that he introduced uh, John to Mark Adamo. Um, like that their first date was like a double date with him and his wife. I, I don't know if that's a real <laughs> But um, I'm saying that this is something that I was told. Um, but like the fact that I, I felt very comfortable choosing that topic with his composition teacher that I might not have felt comfortable with the composition teachers I had during my undergrad in Arizona, um, right? But I mean, on that on the other front, um, you know, uh, Darian was made the point about 
how much of a boys club it is. And I've actually been very fortunate that the majority of my composition teachers have actually been women. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think I've had really like, and, I, and, and the composition teachers who I actually like put on my bio and resume and, and all of that, the people who, who have been the most influential have been women. Um, the, and at MSU, I've, so far, both of my composition teachers have been women. Um, yeah, I should mention that my, uh, the, in undergrad, as much as, a, as much of a boys club as it was as my students, both of my teachers there were women as well. And so it, it, it it can seem very gloom and doom and and in many cases like it is there's definitely problems um that exist but i do think it is important to celebrate that there are really spectacular um music educators out there who aren't old straight white men mm -hmm. um and i mean i think particularly the most famous nadia boulanger um but like who i Think gets a lot of credit but also doesn't get a lot of credit <laughs> mm -hmm. like if that makes sense like i think in the music community people know who nadia boulanger is yeah, but not outside but yeah. not outside the fact that that it's it's uh this person um who is you know i'm not gonna say responsible but like was very influential in so all of contemporary music but yeah. like more than just like classical music like Quincy Jones studied with Nadia Boulanger, right? Mm -hmm. Kurt, Kurt Bacharach, I think. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Like it's it, it's a really interesting, you know, group of people, mm -hmm. um, and and so um, the, you know, it, it's definitely uh, um, so, it's definitely something to celebrate. I, I she celebrated in our community also. I should say it's interesting. It's as as a teacher. Right, like not necessarily right. the right. Yeah, I don't know what point I'm trying to make there, but like, <laughs> interested in you know actually. I've never actually heard any of her music because she stopped composing. Yeah, I know. Well, yeah. you know, what, what I think that maybe thinking of her less as a teacher and more as an influencer. Yeah. Um, okay. But the word influencer mm -hmm. didn't exist in the same <laughs> way, right? Like we think of influencers today, and we think of social media influencers, yeah. right? Um. I think that Nadia, Nadia Blanchet was an influencer um, oh, in a hundred years ago, just a hundred years ago or through, you know, for the last century, right? Um, and if you think of her more like that, mm -hmm. and less as, a, less as a teacher, not that she wasn't a teacher, and I think it's important to celebrate education and teaching, but like, but if you think of her only as a teacher, you're totally undermining what she, like her successes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She was also an important composer, and I haven't really heard a lot of her much performance, weirdly enough. Yeah. Um, she had a really odd, uh, like odd story. Um, her, her younger sister won the Prix de Rome, uh, which was like completely unheard of at the time. She was very young, and then she died very young. And so Nadia, so Lily was the, the sister, uh, Nadia then, like the, the myth is, uh, that she quit composing at that point to like both as a like to carry on her sister's legacy as a, to be a teacher and also because she could never live up to the quality of Lily's work. Yes, um, she's a very interesting and I've read some articles lately potentially problematic. <laughs> 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 yeah. Um, anyways, so uh, I don't want to go from that much longer just for the sake of like I, I, my casserole is out of the oven. Yes. Um, the, we actually will probably have to, to leave shortly. We have yeah. a there's a three year old. Uh, yeah. <laughs> my niece is uh, patiently, patiently waiting. <laughs> oh, please. <laughs> sure. Yes, she, she came up here at some point and she was just staring in the door. Like, <laughs> <laughs> she wasn't. She was like just staring, like <laughs> waving. Yeah, for so, sure. I, I definitely, <laughs> yeah, I definitely want to make sure that uh, we we end very shortly. Um, the I want to see if uh, there's a couple people watching. Wanted to see if anybody has any any questions for um, any of the people who are who are on the stream. Um, 
the and that's okay if you don't but uh um you know this is a new process for me uh doing the live streaming thing i've had a wonderful conversation with the four of you uh, yeah this, this it's been great thank you as well yeah it was great to meet you and i hope i get to meet you both of you guys yes. you know, yeah thanks yes, thank you we look forward to many uh future potential heated conversations yes. <laughs> <laughs> with love <laughs> yeah um but yeah no it's been it's been a lot of fun and uh you know it, it's the reason why I like this live format, um, the, is that there's so many, like when I was editing the video, the videos with like Jennifer and, um, I edited, uh, I edited one with Robin makes sense. Um, Robin, like we had like three hours of conversation, but I had to, I, I didn't, nobody was going to watch a three hour video. Yeah. <laughs> hour video. Um, and so we made that a, you know, I made it a 45 minute episode. And so there's a lot of conversation that got cut out yeah. um, that I felt was a good conversation, but it's just like hard with content to mm -hmm. like decide, well, what is an interesting content? Um, and I, I will say like of all, like everything that we talked about today, I think was interesting. Yeah, definitely. Um, um, and it, like there's there's that more personal like approach when when e I'm not editing anything out nobody um like y y you're probably thinking about what you have to say but you're not um like there isn't that sense of um hey I have to make this into a soundbite right um okay. I, hate that. A little bit I hate that yeah <laughs> <laughs> right and so um the I don't see any questions, although I want to say hi to Katie uh, F. I don't know what Katie's last name is, but she's uh, Natalie's uh, girlfriend, which Natalie is doing a really awesome uh, bassoon academy called Building a Bassoonist uh, about teaching bassoon to uh, young musicians, um, particularly like she's got this, some of the episodes she's been working on right now have been... Um, the like transitioning from this instrument to to bassoon right so like transitioning from saxophone to bassoon right and so um natalie is wonderful i'm both kakia and kendra should know natalie um the she's uh msu bassoon mm -hmm. um but uh it's nice i'm glad that Nat, uh, natalie and katie were watching um ed wendell says cooking with gays so we love Hi, ed. We love Ed. Um, I don't know what uh, yeah. William recruited Ed. No. Scoring well, a talking head. Oh, he's our friend. Scoring a talking head. Um, so the it, you know it, it it's been really lovely having everybody on here. Before before we take off though, um, is your your casseroles out of the oven? It is. Um, can we can we share what our casseroles look like? Sure. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Show off. Oh, <laughs> The, He's gonna bring it over here. Yeah, I'm gonna go. Actually, I can do that. Um, I'll be right back. Uh, I uh, um, definitely made the cooking part optional because part of brunch. Like I, I honestly, if they were, if Kendra and Kakia were actually in, oh, that's beautiful. Oh wow, you. that looks great. Uh, God. Um, if Kendra and Kakia were in um, in Michigan, I might even just like hand deliver them. Some oh, so we, would, we would love some, but <laughs> <laughs> Sunday, Sunday, <laughs> so close. Uh, um, yeah, I tomorrow. Here's mine. Ooh, oh, my. oh, nice, nicely oh, done. Look at this baby. Oh, we would help you eat that definitely. <laughs> well, <laughs> tom well, tomorrow I have. Uh, I'm filming with uh, Grace Jelpy. Um, the and we're making a vegetarian lasagna, so it's yes. uh, wonderful. Nice. The I can share that with you if you'd like. Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we should like, um, put the recipes somewhere. Like oh, the recipe that uh, um, the recipe that uh, Dennis provided me with is in the was on the event and is also on this YouTube page. Awesome. I'm going to. I didn't. I kind of just made up what I did this um, today, and uh, so I will add that recipe to my, I have a blog on my website with all the recipes for okay. the shows that I'll add to that. And if you wanna add, if you would like to add your recipe to that blog, I'm happy to, to do that. Um, put the link in the description. Yeah, we'll, we'll put a link, link in the description. Um, <laughs> the, uh, 
I, I want to thank uh, the four of you for being on today. Thank you. Um, Thank you very much. Thanks. I Thank really much. enjoyed it. Please go all of their websites um, and different social media things, uh, which you can find through that, um, are in the description of this video. Um, and please like this channel uh, or like, like this video, subscribe to the channel, make comments. Please share your own casserole creations because I really want to see it. Um, and I'm sure the others would too, because, um, as you can see, even if you didn't make one, you want to eat it. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, and, uh, which I'm very excited to go eat this. Um, but, uh, I'm, if you liked this content, if you liked the live stream kind of event, um, please let me know. Cause I have to decide if I want to keep doing live stream events. Um, I do have two more planned one with um, Tegan Farron, who is a violinist um, uh, who is starting a degree at Manhattan School of Music in the fall, technically. We, you know, who knows what, what's going on. Um, but the, we're making um, two types of empanadas and two types of, uh, um, of dumplings um, because she just did a Fulbright in Argentina, but she's also half Chinese. So we thought that that would be really interesting since my family, I have family from Argentina, um, but because we're making so much food, we're like, that seems like a live show kind of day. Um, since a lot of it is assembling, right? Yeah. Um, and then um, the following month, um, I, I won't say who the guest is quite yet, but the, um, we're talking about making um, like a full meal, right? Like making, which is different than making a dish, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, but sure. just like making a meal, um, and which also seemed appropriate for a live show. Mm -hmm. uh, and so if you like this, let me know. I really would like to hear from you. Um, and anyways, uh, that's, that's all I want to say. Uh, thank you again. Uh, subscribe to their things. Go check them out. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks for thank having me. Appreciate it. Have a great rest of your day. Happy Friday. Happy Friday. Happy Friday.